Okay, welcome everybody uh, to today's panel discussion, Workflows for Behavioral Health in Primary Care, Adjusting Care Delivery During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is David Ross. I'm the Director of Practice Transformation for Comagine Health, and we're excited uh, to be hosting this discussion today. Uh, just a bit about Comagine Health. Uh, we're a national uh, nonprofit healthcare consulting firm, um, working with all types of providers and patients and payers uh, to do quality improvement in healthcare. For more information on services we provide in system wide QI, care management, consulting and research, HIT, and analytics, please visit comagine.org. I want to point everyone to a specific opportunity if you're located in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, Utah, or New Mexico where we are CMS designated quality improvement organization that we're currently recruiting for a partnership to reimagine healthcare, where we're gonna to address topics like patient safety, preventing and managing diabetes and heart disease, increasing the quality of care transitions and uh, decreasing opioid misuse and improving behavioral health outcomes. So if you're interested in that, um, please visit comagine.org slash partnership for more information. I wanna run through a few quick logistics for today's call. Uh, participants will all remain muted. Um, engagement in terms of asking and questions, asking questions and engaging with panelists can be done through the chat box throughout. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, and just as an FYI, panelists have graciously agreed to stay up to 15 minutes after the session to continue taking questions via the chat box. Uh, lastly, a recording of the session will be posted uh, to the website uh, on Comagine Health website. Um, there will also be a blog post and accompanying comment section added uh, to the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association news site. Uh, the link is there and will pro be provided in the chat where the conversation can continue. Uh, these links and resources uh, will all be uh, sent uh, via an email in the coming days. With that, I wanna thank the sponsors and introduce them to kind of kick this off. Uh, we, we're sponsored, this event is sponsored by Collaborative Family Healthcare Association and the Interprofessional Primary Care Institute. Uh, Dr. Naftali Serrano is the Chief Executive of Officer for CFAJ. Uh, he'll be monitoring the chat box today and responding to questions. Uh, Dr. Serrano himself is a master BHC and past on the ground BHC clinic leader. Dr. Julio Imaja is the director and founder of the Interprofessional Primary Care Institute, uh, which is a community program of George Fox University. Dr. Imaja also is a master BHC and past on the ground BHC clinic leader. And lastly, Dr. Patty Robinson joins us from uh, the Interprofessional Primary Care Institute as well. She's the president of Mountain View Consulting Group, founder of the Primary Care Behavioral Health Model, uh, a master BHC and a prolific writer, and also an international trainer of BHCs who work in primary care. With that, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Oimaja, who will facilitate the discussion moving forward. All right. Well, what brought us here today? Well, first of all, COVID-19. Um, and then secondly, um, behavioral health clinicians in primary care. Um, who are master collaborators, master collaborators within their organizations and master collaborators between organizations. Um, so there was a group of uh, behavioral health clinician leaders in Oregon who uh, lead across multi-clinic systems who uh, realized that in early March, uh, there was a need for some significant course uh, corrections in terms of workflow development on the ground and how we did, how we would do behavioral health clinician uh, services in this current context. Um, questions were floating around like, um, are BHCs exclusively um, working over telehealth? Are they working from home? Are they working from the office? What about PPE with uh, behavioral health clinicians who work in primary care? Lots of questions. And so a group of folks in Oregon came together and started to compile best practices. Um, and one thing was, was sure is that there was massive implementation of telehealth very quickly and a need for support um, for these on the ground leaders um, in making those kinds of changes. Um, so this group noticed um, that Dr. Serrano of the Cloward Family Healthcare Association had offered office hours uh, around telehealth. And so we joined uh, in some office hours around telehealth and what became uh, apparent in that conversation is uh, BHCs, uh, we're dealing with ma major changes in workflow uh, in this context in Oregon, but also throughout the country. And what followed was a fantastic uh, national collaborative effort 
to develop a, um, a white paper and best practice guidelines for BHCs who work in primary care in this context. Um, and you will find that um, on the CFHA website now under the press releases. Um, what we also realized is that after we uh, compiled the, this information and then disseminated it, we also realized there was a need for more work um, on the ground, um, in the weeds, uh, to help BHC leaders and BHCs um, make these huge changes in workflow. Um, so uh, we circled back with our friends at Comagine um, who offered uh, to hold this webinar, and so here we are today. So we're going to be able to talk to um, four different organizations in terms of how they have adjusted um, for early adopter and advanced behavioral health clinician and primary care organizations and how they have uh, adjusted to this current context and continue to provide the care, which in this context is needed more than ever. So with no further ado to that, um, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Patty Robinson, who is a co-founder of the primary care behavioral health model, um, and have her discuss a little bit about what PCBH is. So this is the GATHER acronym, uh, something we use to try to consistently hit all of the major strategies associated with the primary care behavioral health approach to integrating behavioral health services into primary care. So G is for generalists, so behavioral health consultants working in this model are generalists. That means that they provide care to people of all ages from the very, very young to the very, very old. And they address all behavioral issues. So people that are suffering from psychological problems, from medical problems, from social problems, and any combination of those problems. Um, their services are designed to be accessible. So uh, most BHC services are available for patients on a same day basis. That's whether it's an initial or first visit with a BHC or it's a follow-up visit. They're also accessible in terms of uh, being immediately available to all the colleagues on their interprofessional teams. Uh, services are team-based, so BHCs tend to sit with their colleagues, which is, uh, uh, has been a challenge in, in many practice settings during COVID, and they know what's happening in the team in a real-time sort of way so that they can step up and be available and uh, do what needs to be done uh, to support, really, the work of the team. Um, so, uh, again, uh, they are also aiming for high productivity, so uh, they want to help as many people as possible. So this has taken some thought during COVID. Um, and uh, then routine pathways. Uh, so we really want services that we deliver to become just a routine part of good health care. And um, to help this happen effectively, and um, we really need to kind of work in pathway kinds of ways uh, to quickly partner with individual um, uh, primary care providers to uh, honor any kind of standing order that they would like to make in whatever context of care, including the pandemic and that uh, we pay close attention in pathways, of course, to workflows. And um, a lot, that's where, uh, that's where the detail really comes in. And that's what our panelists are going to talk about today. So it's a pleasure to listen to them and, and hear about the innovative uh, ways that they've worked within this model to, um, do their part to improve the health of the population. Well, let's uh, introduce our panel today, our behavioral health clinician leader panel. 
So today we have um, Dr. Bridget Beachy, who is the Behavioral Health Director, um, and Dr. David Powman, who's the Behavioral Health Education Director, both from Community Health of Central Washington with us today. Uh, we also have Dr. Elizabeth zeidler schreeder uh, Chief Behavioral Health Officer from Access Community Health Centers in Wisconsin. Um, we also have Dr. Kristen Garcia, um, who is a service director at medical uh, and medical and integrated behavioral health, uh, service director of medical and integrated behavioral health at LifeWorks Northwest in Oregon. Um, and then we have Dr. Laura Fisk and Sharon Smith, um, uh, primary care behavioral health leaders from Kaiser Permanente in Oregon. So we'll start off here with um, just this is kind of like a general workflow uh, in primary care practices and what we had our um, our panelists do is look at this workflow um, and think about way, the way in which we generally work um, as BHCs in primary care our workflow generally and what has changed what has changed in the workflow in uh, the current COVID-19 context and we've got great um, thoughts um, across these different buckets within this workflow in terms of what people have changed um, in workflow in the last few weeks. So we'll move forward um, with Dr. Uh, Beachy and Dr. Bauman um, talking about what has happened at Community Health of Central Washington. All right, and first let us just say uh, we uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, speak and join with uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a humbling moment in a lot of ways to be presenting with everybody that's uh, on this uh, call right now and be a part of this panelist. So we really appreciate the opportunity and we're excited to talk about uh, some of the different things that have happened um, uh, Community Health of Central Washington and Yakima, Washington. All right. We're yeah. trying to set a timer right now because we want to make sure that... To be uh, as you can imagine with all the panelists... We can talk for days. Yeah. So, but we're, we're, gonna, we're not going to. <laughs> we're not going to try. Five minutes. Everyone relax. Okay, so at Community Health of Central Washington, Dave and I are essentially co-directors. He uh, oversees the education programs and I oversee the clinical programs, but obviously a lot of that is interconnected. So just to get you orientation to our organization, uh, we are a federally qualified health center. We have five primary care clinics in Central Washington um, and we uh, follow the PCBH model as uh, Patty um, described in awesome detail, that was great. And um, just again to orient that our BHC team, just at baseline, not in COVID times, we make up about 10% of all visits. Um, and then the other 90% are medical visits. And we have approximately, if you added up everybody's time in clinic, uh, we have about seven to eight full-time equivalent clinical coverage. Uh, and uh, in a given year, BHCs are having over 10,000 visits with over 2,500 patients in uh, generally speaking about a 12 month snapshot. So we're seeing a lot of folks and uh, providing a lot of care. All right, so COVID hits and our chief, <laughs> I know everyone's PTSD activated. Um, COVID hits and our chief medical officer uh, basically takes the lead in our organization with putting together operations calls and is um, kind of the, the, the point person for all of our clinics to figure out what are we gonna do. And when I say we, I mean the whole primary care practice. So there was a lot of meetings that were had between uh, the medical site directors, uh, us as Director of Behavioral Health, um, pharmacists, and uh, basically other leaders in our system. And so when I was talking with him as well as the fellow clinic manager site directors, I essentially said that um, treat BHC the way we would treat medical services if a patient had a chronic condition such as diabetes and they needed to be seen and taken care of, but they did not need a physical exam that day. And so that's kind of became our lit litmus test for what we do as BHCs because it is an essential service. We need to be available and we need to be there, but we don't need to have any type of physical exam where it has, you know, where it's in person. Uh, so there were a lot of iterations. We won't bore you all with that. There was tons of iterations. But the current iteration that we are on 
is that all providers from BHCs to advanced practice clinicians, physicians, as well as the staff uh, come to the clinic for work every day. Uh, unless they have admin time or paperwork, they can work from home. And that's what I'm on right now, uh, which is why we're at home. Um, and we can do phone visits, Zoom visits, Doximity, DoxyMe, uh, as well as some in-person options. At this point, the support staff, so we're talking reception to medical assistants, nursing, are handling all scheduling, all check-in and check-out, uh, checking patients in and out, as well as uh, sending out invites for if they're going to use, say, Zoom or a video audio platform. Uh, and we have an instant messenger system uh, that we use, Microsoft Teams. And so we're Teamsing within, you know, between BHC and reception, medical assistants, nurses. But essentially, the support staff is going to be handling those aspects. Billing, coding, and IT all got together with um, the physician leaders as well as BHC leaders and uh, made a workflow for compliance with billing. And so they created us templates that have checkboxes uh, that have all the essential elements that are needed for, it to, to, for visits essentially to, to count. And I wanted to highlight that because when we talk about the, the difficulties of COVID, I mean, reaching our communities, our patients is one big part of that. The other big part of this is that we've never done this before as far as providing uh, uh, visits via telehealth and all the different requirements that are part of the billing, what has to be documented. And you can imagine if you're a physician or if you're a BHC, if you're a provider of any type, documentation is always the bane of our existence. Um, and then one of the things that we are really proud of is how much our billing, our coding, our IT, and our providers all came together to come up with workflows that not only allowed us to see our patients, but allowed us to document in a way that wasn't gonna be taxing on any part of the system. And so for, for clinics, just so you know, nobody freaks out, we are seeing people still in person, but they are screened for COVID um, on, the, on the phones. When they come into the door, they have a temperature check. Everybody's given masks, staff need to wear masks. We're trying to do as much social distancing as humanly possible while we're physically in the clinic. If somebody has any type of concern reg regarding COVID, then they're gonna go ahead and they're gonna do a car visit. Now, the cool thing is, is we've been available for warm handoffs for those car visits, but we use the phone. So the nursing staff would alert us via our regular Teams and uh, Microsoft Teams, Instant Message. We come over, we can have that phone call uh, with that patient while they're in the car if they are needed to be seen. We have not had a situation where it was so extreme of a crisis where we had to get in PPE um, and go out there. We've been able to mitigate that. And just, you know, uh, the BHC in their regular clinic is gonna be doing tons of phone visits, some video visits and uh, in-person visits as well as warm handoffs. And we're gonna do whatever medium most of the time that the, that the physician's doing. So like I said, the physician does the car, then we're gonna do the phone. If the physician does Zoom, uh, they're gonna get us on Zoom. The medical assistant will get us on Zoom. Physicians doing phone, we'll do phone. And if it's in person, uh, then we will do uh, in person. And the BHC team along with nursing and care coordination did a ton of outreach to try to get folks who may have um, uh, you know, mental health as well as chronic uh, medical conditions. And the one thing that we wanted to uh, end on is just kind of what this past month has looked like as far as productivity. In one minute. In one minute. And the one thing that we always like to highlight, while we're big data people, if anybody's on CFHA listserv, we're always sending out our data. Uh, we think the tracking productivity and metrics are very important to program fidelity. The one thing, though, we don't want to get lost in this is that the number isn't the goal. The number is a reflection of our value of serving our community, of being a part of primary care. And what we saw in April is about 65% of our visits were via telehealth. Um, April was actually our second most productive month ever as a BHC uh, program, and we've been recording data since 2016. Uh, we completed over 1,100 uh, total BHC uh, billable visits. We always make that clarification. These aren't uh, meet and greets. It's not saying meet and greets are wrong by any means. We're just, when we're tracking, it's billable visits. The core BHC team averaged around 10 patients a day with a range with including our doctoral interns and fellows, that's about 8.6 uh, per day as far as billable visits. Handoffs, while it was lower, we still almost completed 200 handouts uh, through the month. And then as far as same day visits and paired visits was over uh, 230 uh, same day and paired. And I will say this is for April. 
And for May, they're really getting the hang of it. So whatever, again, system that the physician or the advanced practice clinician is using or medium, they utilize us for those warm handoffs while we're uh, in clinic. Fantastic. All right, we're gonna move forward here. Thank you so much. Hmm. There we are. And I'll introduce uh, Dr. Ziedler Schreider, Sh Schreider, uh, Ziedler Schreider uh, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about uh, what's been happening at Access Community Health Centers. Right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Excited um, to be here and to share um, with fellow BHCs. Um, for me, I think one of the things the pandemic has really highlighted is the value um, of having behavioral health integrated into primary care and how we can serve not only um, our patients, but also support the needs of the care team as a whole. Um, I've been so impressed. I think BHCs at their core are flexible and adaptive, um, and that has been highlighted, I think, to a whole new level. Um, as we've had to respond very quickly um, in real time and in a, a fluidity that I think we've never had to have um, with changes kind of happening daily um, and that initial response. Um, and so we very quickly um, in mid-March actually went from one day of covering kind of routinely to the next day um, flipping to predominantly telehealth. And so Access Community Health Center is also an FQHC um, in the state of Wisconsin, and we have um, 17 sister FQHC in the state. And a lot of the efforts have been coordinated um, to try to advocate on a state level as well um, related to reimbursement um, for telephonic only. Um, we found for our patient population, particularly when we think about health disparities, um, access to whatever modality for virtual visits, whether that be video or telephone or asynchronous through my chart is really, really important. Um, and so the month of April, after we made that flip, 98% of our our visits um, were virtual. And so a vast majority of that became telephonic. But what we found was that on this on-site um, support for our care teams was still really, really important. And so we have three primary care um, medical sites in the Madison area, and we did keep one BHC on site at the essential care clinic um, for essential medical care that was still happening. Um, because having that person on site to be able to answer the phone calls that are transferred from the call center um, was really, really important. And the rest of my staff moved to working remotely. And and that was a very intentional decision um, based on the need for physical distancing um, in our clinical spaces. We all share this amazing pod um, and work together and rub shoulders, which is great pre-pandemic. Um, in the context of the need for physical distancing, that became more challenging. And so to really figure out in real time, how do we still support the care teams on the front lines? How do we still support our patients? But how do we still adapt with awareness of shortage of PPE? Um, and so we were having consistent BHC in the clinic um, that were, you know, had their mask. But if we could do a virtual visit, that was always the default. There have been instances where a virtual visit was contraindicated, didn't work. Um, and so those cases, we did bring patients in. Um, you know, when, when Patty talked about gather, accessibility is important and so being flexible and how we maintain that accessibility is crucial um, and so our staff were trained then to be able to, to wear the face mask the, the shield their um, their gown and so if needed that's what we would do um, but again if you look at our numbers 98% of that is virtual and so if we need the PPE we have access to it we've trained and we know how to leverage it um, but when we can conserve that then we can. And I think that flexibility, again, is really important. As I mentioned, advocacy, I think, is key. I did a, a happy dance um, on the 30th when the new Medicare guidelines came out related to um, reimbursement for telephonic only, um, because I think that a lot of times sets precedence of what happens at the state level. Um, and so I think that is really important. Um, but I also think it's important to know the patients in which we serve. Um, and so at times um, there are barriers. And when we think again about health disparities and access to broadband internet and minutes and phones, um, it's really important to keep that in mind. And so that was something for us um, that was at the forefront. Forefront. Um, one of the ways that we've all stayed connected um, is the development of a virtual huddle. Um, so every morning, all of our BHCs are on a WebEx and we're doing a virtual huddle to talk about who's scheduled for the day, who's taking who, how we're making assignments. 
Um, our medical colleagues are sending us CC charts and EPIC um, for a same day outreach call that they need. We have a BHC in the morning that we assign to be that in basket lead so that we're constantly being able to respond um, again in very, very rapid fashion um, to meet the needs of our patients. Um, but that daily virtual huddle has been incredibly helpful to make sure that we can respond um, and that our team stays connected. Um, because I think we're all so used to, uh, myself as being an extrovert, right? You thrive off that contact with others and working remotely um, can definitely be an adjustment and a shift. Um, one of the other things that's been really helpful when you have multiple team members and lots of different workflow changes and visit type and epic change to telemed phone visit and you use it in this context, having a centralized document um, that we were able to update in real time that all BHCs could access um, became really important. And at the bottom of it, we were updating basically the date that it changed. So you could always reference back to be like, wait, is this the most current um, workflow? Because for a while we had lots of changes. Um, so that is something that I was going to share um, just to have access. But as I mentioned, it's a fluid document. So if you check the, the link that's there, it may have changed. Um, but it has what we need for coding, how we consistently code. We adjusted. I also shared our smart phrase again in Epic um, that has the drop downs that we need um, to be able to do video versus telephonic um, and really trying to make it as straightforward as possible um, for our behavioral health providers. As I mentioned when I first started talking, I think the workflow piece is really, really important for how we provide the provision of care and the ability to pivot. But one of the other ways that I think we are so valuable um, to the healthcare system as a whole is how we can really promote care team and organizational wellness. And I, I have seen that firsthand in the impact that we have around attuning to how you take care of your personal needs. Um, when there's a high stress environment, we're leading mindfulness sessions um, twice a week for all staff because we do have some staff that are in the clinics, some more of our dental providers that are working remotely um, for some triage stuff and those that maybe aren't able to work because of the, of the capacity of their role right now. So having the ability to have one unified um, time to come in and to do some mindfulness and focus on wellness has been really important. We also do a debrief um, provider wellness once a week. During our leadership huddle, we're kind of always putting out there a few wellness tidbits. Um, we went into the clinic to put together a gratitude tree to just really try to kind of how do we slow down um, and check in with ourselves um, as we're doing this work. Um, and then we also helped collaborate to develop an internal wellness resource page for, for all staff to be able to leverage. So when we think about the value add of behavioral health, I think it's really important to look at the clinical care piece, um, but also how we promote teamwork, communication, wellness, and resiliency in the context of integrated care. And to me, um, that's BHC work at its finest. Wow, that is just fantastic. I just have to take a moment and reflect on uh, the two presentations so far, how reflective of BHCs and their tireless work um, to, uh, to improve population health. Um, so much has happened and what a, um, these folks are uh, able to make these kind of changes due to that flexibility uh, that Beth talked about earlier, fantastic. Okay, moving forward. All right, Dr. Kristen Garcia is gonna tell us what has been going on at LifeWorks Northwest and the various different clinics that uh, they work with to integrate behavioral health clinicians. Well, hi there, thank you so much, Julie, and thank you everyone. I'm gonna mirror all of my colleagues and just saying I'm honored to be on the conversation and to be sitting at the table with everyone and participating. Um, I am the Director of Medical and Integrated Services and one of my roles in the integrated part of um, my is that we work with primary care partners around the area and place some of our mental health staff as BHCs and embed them within primary care settings. So at this time, we have about 20 or so staff embedded in primary care partners around the area. Specifically, we have three different federally qualified healthcare systems we're working with across four counties in Oregon. And it's been interesting to watch the three different and separate federally qualified systems um, all landed on having our behavioral health clinicians work remotely. So at this time, all of my staff are 100% working remotely from home and are therefore 100% telehealth. We have had a couple instances where it's come up against different needs and we, to ensure accessibility, staff are always willing to go into the clinic, 
gear up and engage with clients if necessary. It hasn't come to that just yet, but we have that in the wind, kind of in the back wings if we needed it. Um, but it, just painting a picture of that, anybody that's ever worked with me knows that I love the process of how we get there, what we learn along the way, and able to learn on how to move forward and do something different or what can I remember and engage. And I think through this process of coming to the table for this conversation, my passion and my appreciation for the PCBH model has been validated and heightened because it's so relevant. It's been so fluid and it it's translated really nicely to a telehealth platform in a lot of regards. I always like to think about it reducing barriers. I love the accessibility piece of it, but I've also always thought about a connectivity piece of the model where we're connecting clients. We're connecting them to the community. We're connecting them to their medical teams. We're helping kind of bridge gaps in a lot of ways. And so looking back, I sat with my team actually and said, you know, through this process, what would you guys want to be talking about? What are the workflows or what are the things that have kind of mattered more to you as BHCs and over the last couple of months? And hands down, all of them came and Beth teed this up beautifully for me actually in saying, I would want to highlight, I don't think I knew how much I relied on my medical teams and my integrated settings for how much I valued their partnership. It wasn't around, yes, we know we serve them. We work with our medical teams. We bring in expertise and a lens for patient care, but they're giving so much to us and replenishing how much we shoulder the stress. We carry that forward. And so I really saw and wanted to think about just how connectivity kind of played into this. Um, and so I'm thinking I'm moving the slides along. There we go. With my staff working from home, we knew connectivity counts, but maybe it counts even more. And I thought about it in a phased, a phased fashion. So early on after the pandemic kind of hit, there was this need to connect to patients quick internally. How are we going to get the workflows out? How are we going to connect to our teams? How are we going to make sure we've coded? We've got the audits there. We were working with everybody to make that's happening. Externally, we had patients that are isolated, they're worried, and they're a captive and ready audience, which is kind of led us to be able to do this work and engage our teams and engage our patients. Through that, I realized I needed to connect to my team better. I needed to be more effective in how I'm communicating with them. Where can I have real-time real documents live? How do we not get an email message lost in the hundreds of emails that were coming at us for months at a time? So how, do, how could I do that? And I, I focused my attention there. And what I missed and what I knew as a practicing clinician, but as a manager in the midst of it, was I didn't give nearly enough attention to connect back to the clinics and back to the staff. And so that's where I kind of wanted to live just for the last few minutes was this is where we're working now is really how and what can we be doing to connect back to the clinics? Because as David and Bridget um, talked about our April was also, across most systems, our most productive month we had seen to date. And I think, like we highlighted, there's a captive audience. It makes it a little bit easier and a lot of worry and a lot of need to connect to other people. And so that, that brought forward our ability to produce and our, the, highlighted the value of what we were doing. And yet my team's morale was low. It was, they were struggling and they were doing great work. They were being, all of it was going well. And what we came to this work for was our patient care, our ability to engage them. What we didn't realize is how we become embedded in our clinics and in our teams and relied on our professional partners for that. And so not only how do we take care of our clinics, and the staff, but how do we take care of ourselves in that regard? And so what was missing was that connection to the docs, to our MAs, to the nurses, and how do we get back to that to make sure that we're feeling that sense of community remotely? So we started working um, around curbside consultation. We have a chat feature in Epic, and you saw the docs start to want to type it in, and they're like, oh, more complex, maybe I'll give you a call. And that's coming back online as they're, the docs are getting to come up for air and they don't have so much literature and change coming at them at the same time. 
we started piloting um, huddles in the morning with our BHC engaging. Uh, it's different in different clinics. Sometimes it's teams, so two docs at once, and they're kind of reviewing cases or different people they might want to engage versus um, just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we did do, we've piloted a virtual Baylic group uh, at one of our clinics, and then we started some virtual lunch and learns to just bring back some of that normalcy to learning and connecting to the clinics and the teams. And so I just, I appreciate the process. I've loved the change and the learning through it, but I've also really loved the reminder of getting back to how much we too have relied on the friendships, the partnerships, and the professionalism brought to integrated care. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kristen. I love the phased um, way you went through thinking that. Um, I, I'm sure that that was super helpful to a lot of people out there, how to make some sense out of a lot of, a lot of chaos. That was just fantastic. All right, moving on. Uh, we get to hear from Dr. Laura Fisk and Sharon Smith uh, talk about a workflow changes uh, at Kaiser Permanente in Oregon. Thank you, Julie. Uh, this is Sharon. I'm the primary care behavioral health supervisor at Kaiser Permanente in the Northwest region. And Laura and I are going to tag team here in our presentation. Um, and I just want to also say um, how grateful I am to be a part of this panel. I'm learning a lot from the other folks that are presenting here. And um, also just really grateful thinking back at the growth of our BHC program at Kaiser over the last five years. And um, what we're able to offer members today, given what's going on in the world that we would not have been able to offer um, five years ago, three years ago, uh, two years ago. And so just really grateful as our team has expanded um, the impact that we're able to have on, on, on member care uh, for folks that are going through this um, pandemic. So um, I'll do a bit of an introduction. Uh, we have 36 BHCs and 17 uh, primary care clinics across Oregon and Washington, from Eugene, Oregon, up to Longview, Washington. Um, during our portion here, uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of workflows, including a virtual warm handoff workflow that we've developed as our BHUs have moved to 100% telehealth, um, as well as some screening questions um, that we have created as part of a, work a workflow. Um, when patients call into primary care um, and talk to a patient access specialist um, seeking um, support from their primary care provider, um, some screening questions that could help us maybe redirect them to the BHC, um, either in um, addition to or, um, or uh, as an alternative to get some support around stress or anxiety related uh, to COVID. Um, as time permits, we're also going to track it. I like the idea of the timer. Um, we'll share additional initiatives that we've been working on to support um, not only the members, but um, also the primary care um, clinicians and staff uh, who, who are also um, um, managing their own stress through this time. So then I will hand it over to Laura for the next section. Great, right, thank you, Sharon. Um, and again, I um, also want to um, just echo what Sharon said and the other panelists of just grateful uh, for being here and being able um, to speak with all of you guys today. Um, so to start on the um, slide, currently is our warm handoff, um, our virtual warm handoff workflow. And so just wanting um, to walk you all through this. Um, so a little bit of um, background, as Sharon had mentioned, that all of our BHCs are currently providing 100% virtual care. Um, so that can be either phone or video, and then um, as well as majority are working um, remotely also. Um, so within Kaiser Permanente, uh, we were actually set up prior um, to the whole pandemic uh, to use Microsoft Teams for um, whether it was virtual meetings or just engaging in chat features um, to talk across the um, either within the BHC team as well as in the primary care teams, just given just the spread of our region and wanting to stay um, connected um, prior to the pandemic. Um, and so with that, even some of our MAs and PCPs were accustomed to communicating with BHC via the Microsoft Teams um, as they're also located in different parts of our medical buildings. And so wanting that kind of quick access and quick response as patients um, are in the medical office. Um, so with that, um, we really transitioned our workflow to maximize the use of the chat feature in order to communicate real-time coordination uh, in the form of this virtual warm handoff between PCPs and BHCs. Um, so the idea with it is that um, as a PCP is providing a visit with a member, so um, we're doing a lot of telehealth uh, too with primary care, but also face-to-face -face as well. Um, the PCP can connect with the BHC uh, via 
a team's chat during the medical visit, so just in real time. And then from there, the PC, or the BHCs can communicate back when they're able to either reach out with the patient if it's you know, right there in the moment after the PCP visit or at a later time during the day. Um, and so that way that gets coordinated um, right then and there as the PCP is talking with the member. Uh, in addition, MAs also regularly schedule patients into the BHC schedule, so um, we have an alternative option as well, so PCPs can also coordinate with the MAs that they're working with, um, and they're um, thoroughly trained in making sure patients um, get popped into our schedule that we're aware of the need of connecting with the member, um, and so um, can go from, from there. Um, so, you know, in the the PCBH model, we highly value um, the use of um, same-day appointments, that accessibility piece that um, Patty had mentioned. Uh, so if there's a case that the BHCs are not um, available same day um, at the medical office or medical office building that they're at, it's, uh, we do offer BHC appointments in the, um, a different medical clinic as well. So that way um, we can do our best to try to get that connection to the member that day. Um, the exception that I always just like to highlight is um, we do end up utilizing our crisis team if there is more of an urgent or um, imminent um, concern or risk for a patient. Uh, so in addition, I um, also want to highlight similar to um, what Kristen uh, was mentioning about um, just staying um, connected, wanting to stay top of mind and engage with primary care, especially as we're working virtually. Uh, and remotely. And so um, BHCs throughout the region um, will participate in a virtual primary care huddle, um, really just to um, stay in touch with what's going on with primary care, as well as being able to communicate to the teams as needed. Um, and then some BHCs are also sending their availability to the primary care providers at the beginning of every day, just reminding them kind of availability in their schedule um, and um, to let them know that um, they're there in order um, to connect with members as needed throughout the day. Uh, I'm going to hand it back over um, to Sharon um, to talk about uh, our next piece. Sure, just a couple more things and then uh, I'll wrap up here. Um, just wanted to touch base on that other workflow um, that we created for any of our 600,000 plus members that may call our main primary care line. If they um, talk about any stress or anxiety related to COVID, we just have a couple of uh, screening questions. Um, if they're needing to talk to a medical provider about physical health symptoms, of course, we want to get them to the medical provider. If there's an um, immediate crisis um, or urgent need, um, we do have our crisis line for that. But otherwise, they can be offered um, and are being offered an appointment with a behavioral health consultant to talk a bit more about coping strategies um, for the stress or anxiety that they're experiencing. Um, and same thing, if the BHC at their panel um, medical office building isn't available, we have um, other resources in, in the same service area that we can offer them. Um, in addition, um, we have some BHCs that have been developing um, a pathway, a, a group um, of uh, COVID-19 stress. Uh, we haven't implemented it yet. We're working on getting the Zoom licensure for the BHCs to offer this, um, but um, it'll be through the virtual platform and uh, where uh, there can be education and skills uh, for patients calling um, to learn about coping with COVID-19, uh, but also giving uh, members an opportunity to have social connection and support during this time. Um, the last thing is we're really wanting to support our um, providers and our, our, our staff that are working through this. And we have some BHCs offering an in-service um, in their primary care clinic, um, very similar to the other one I heard about where they're doing two kind of 15 minute um, uh, relaxation kind of guided exercises or education around stress management twice a week. Um, and then also really promoting the EAP services that are, that are available to, to staff here as well. Um, and that's been really well received and uh, staff seem to be appreciating it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Laura. What, how fantastic. Um, what I, you know, what I just reflect on is uh, the amazing biopsychosocial primary care services that are happening for all people in your collective systems. It's just fantastic um, that you are there and ready to support all the time, and particularly during this time where all of our um, behavioral health um, is going to be impacted by such a significant event as COVID-19. Um, what fantastic service is being provided. All right, so we are moving into our Q&A 
And Dr. Serrano has been following the chat and actually several of the members have been following the chat and answering questions as we go. But now is the time to open it up and uh, we, we are making good time today um, to have a robust uh, conversation between panelists um, and between uh, anyone out there who would like to provide a question. I'll let you take it over, Dr. Serrano. Yeah, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you again to everyone and thank you for your work. I mean, it's just encouraging to feel like you guys are out there on the front lines uh, doing this work on behalf of our fellow uh, citizens and particularly many of you that are working in underserved settings. Uh, really just being there for, for the most marginalized among uh, our population. So fantastic stuff. Um, it's been a really great chat with some really uh, good questions. So I'm gonna jump in with some of the things that were brought up in the chat and just ask for you guys to, to comment. Um, I think one of the things that I've heard people struggle with that's reflected in the chat is sort of the mechanics of this, how to do warm handoffs, particularly if folks weren't used to communicating uh, with each other in these sort of digital ways prior to the fact. So for example, uh, David um, and Bridget, you guys talked about how you use Microsoft Teams to uh, facilitate the warm handoffs, right? So I'd like to ask each of you what the mechanics are, like practically, if a physician sees a patient, wants that patient seen by a BHC, how do they make that work with you? And then how do you make, it, make the connection back to seamlessly make that happen with the patient? So anybody can answer. I'll just start with David and Bridget real quick around that. So you guys can just uh, give us a clue as to how that works from your side. Yeah, so uh, as we said, everybody in our clinic is, um, is on site from the MAs to the physicians to the BHCs. So if a physician is in their clinic and they're say doing a Zoom visit, they have their MA who's working alongside of them. What they'll do is they will uh, Teams us through Microsoft Teams and say warm handoff back a silver because now everybody is like you know our clinic's pretty big so everyone has these different pockets to try to keep that social distancing as well as so that they can operate and do zoom visits so we'll walk back there and uh talk with them and if it's a zoom visit then the medical assistant will get that started for us they'll send an invite to the patient get it on our computer and start it if there's if we need an interpreter at that point for both the, um audio visual so zoom or phone, then we will go into, like I said, one of these back rooms and uh, put it on speakerphone and do the visit right then and there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the nice things that uh, with this being a lot of uh, telehealth, um, you know, when we're more in person, uh, we have this general rule of thumb, you never miss a handoff, right? And so uh, we have this response if you need to respond back to the team's uh, request within three minutes and we are immediately trying to go see that patient. One of the things that's been nice with this flexibility is that we've been able to, um, if it's gonna be 20 to 30 minutes before we can get, say we're on a uh, visit with another patient or no one's free at that time, uh, patients have been really great about saying, hey, call me when you can. Uh, yeah, call or, me in the next hour. Call me in the next hour. So it's actually given us a lot more flexibility. I don't think we've missed a handoff in the past two months. Um, we'll knock on wood because of that flexibility and because of our support staff communicating back to the patient. It is like, almost well. always the medical assistant. So the physician alerts the medical assistant and then the medical assistant does the coordination to get a hold of the BHC. There are some physicians that prefer to just do it themselves, but we have kind of trained it to be MA to BHC. Great. So any of the panelists want to chime in on how they, just to give another exemplar, because each clinic setup is so different, um, at least folks hopefully get, get some principles. Who else can tell us a little bit about how these warm handoffs are performed at your clinic? I'm happy to talk through that. Um, we, uh, like I mentioned, so our staff are remote, so we're not on site and our staff are operating in Epic, which a chat feature came online really early on in this process. So we have um, our, our providers are in their telehealth. So they're on their telehealth visit with their patients. If they are identifying a need for a warm handoff, they're then using the new Epic chat feature to reach out to both of the behavioral health clinicians that are assigned to their clinic in live time saying, hey, I've got a warm handoff. I'd like to transfer this over. Um, if that, if assuming one of them was available, they say, great, transfer it to this number and they give them their Zoom 
number and their Zoom waiting room, and the provider is able to transfer the telephone call right onto their computer. So we're doing it in that regard. Um, if they weren't available, we do have a separate chat set up with all of our team across the agency because we have the flexibility and we wanted to ensure accessibility that if they both were not available and on another call and the patient really needed some support, they're able to reach out to the others um, internally and say, hey, who could take this call right now? Somebody needs some support from X clinic with this provider. And they'd be like, I got it, have them send it here. And so they would jump in and kind of move through the chat feature in that regard. Um, and to close that loop, then the clinician that was picking it up would then chat the PCP and say, hey, I know they're not available. I'm available. Please send it over to this line instead. And it's being transferred to them. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I know we could talk more about that and feel free to uh, uh, talk about that. But there's another huge area that's very timely right now that's brought up in the chat um, by a couple of discussants. And this is about returning to in person. Now, as states are slowly reopening, some slower than others, um, businesses, uh, healthcare, including primary care, is starting to make plans in that direction. I'm sure most of your clinics are thinking about that, if not already taking steps in that regard. So uh, I want you to talk a little bit about what criteria you're using to figure out when, if, and under what conditions behavioral health folks begin to take more and more of these visits in person. Beth, uh, we'll start with you. Thank you. Just the real, allow me an easy one. Um, no, I think that this is actually a really important topic, um, but I think what's really, really crucial here is that we, we don't function in isolation. And so behavioral health um, is much, is embedded, right, as part of the larger healthcare home. And so that's not a decision me as the chief behavioral health officer is gonna make in isolation without collaboration with our chief medical officer um, and other medical providers. And so I think that's a really important piece to put out there. Um, we have things set up where we have multiple you know, sites in the Madison area, but we have one clinical location that's focused more on respiratory symptoms and the other site is focused more on essential everyday primary care. Um, and so, you know, similarly to how Dr. Bauman re, you know, mentioned that people with symptoms are, you know, at the car, people with symptoms go to our respiratory screening sites. Um, and so they don't come into, um, you know, the essential care site. And so I, I think right now, though, we wouldn't be pushing to have more in-person visits until we started seeing more in-person visits for more medical you know, cases. And so we would be following suit, I think, for more of what's happening on a medical basis. Um, I also think that there is something to be said versus the therapeutic alliance that I can have over the phone or through a video visit versus having with me masked downed face shield um, and what that does as far as our ability to engage. And so I think that it's really important for us to say what value add um, does it have by meeting face to face? Um, and are we able to have a functional equivalent um, to a face to face encounter through a virtual forum? And that's really important. Important. The other piece is space. I think we have to be really cognizant of space considerations and, and PPE um, and access to PPE. And so for me, those are all of the thought processes I think I keep in at the forefront of my mind. But again, they're not ones I'm making in isolation. And I think collaborating um, with the greater medical team as well as the leadership team around readiness and when the time is right is important. And it's going to be different times, I think, for different clinics um, based on what's happening in our community. Yeah, absolutely. that's fantastic, Beth. I think folks are coming to realize too that behavioral health um, is a little bit distinct in the healthcare space. Our work does not require physical examinations. Um, our work does not require um, laying on of hands. Um, and our evidence suggests that tele telehealth is as effective as um, the 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 um, 3D things that we do in person. So. Um, we, uh, we are very effective in this format, and I think this has changed our work um, for the future. You know, uh, we'll see. But um, what, we, what we're thinking about is, uh, as BHCs, is accessibility always. 
And what we've shown <laughs> over the course of a very quick implementation is that we can be highly accessible to, um, to people in our population um, through telehealth. And we already know that telehealth for what we do distinctly is highly effective. Um, so I, this is really, um, there are some significant changes that are happening now and happening quickly. Um, but I, I just really do believe that for us distinctly as behavioral health, um, this may very well change the way that we do care into the future. So, uh, I completely agree with that. I feel like the pandemic has potentially been a catalyst, right, for some of this to happen more quickly. I mean, telehealth were conversations we were having at an organizational level, um, but we were looking at, you know, strategic plan 18 to 24 months, and then we implemented all of it in like two weeks. Um, and so I think that it just sped up that process. Um, but it's here, and I think it's definitely here to stay, and how we continue to fine tune that and then advocate um, related to parity and reimbursement. I think is also going to be really important to make it sustainable in the future. Absolutely. Laura, Sharon, I want to hear from you guys. Are you guys uh, thinking about going back in, in clinic and, and any considerations you're thinking about uh, with respect to future delivery services, say, in the next four to six weeks? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely entering the conversation. I, um, you know, I think a lot of what um, Beth had mentioned as far as um, working really closely with the primary care um, teams, the physicians, our organization as well. Um, I think we want to carry or hold safety um, out front and first and foremost with as far as if it's, um, as mentioned, the PPE use, um, social distancing, um, rooms, room cleaning, you know, after a patient visit. And so uh, I think that there's a lot that uh, needs to go into the planning of it to be planful um, before we just jump in and engage in face-to-face -face care. And so it's definitely not a light switch um, that we'll wake up one morning and I'll return back to the clinic. So we're really wanting to make sure we have good workflows and protocols in place um, so that, you know, we're able to meet patients when they're in the clinic, um, but do it in a safe manner as well. Um, so conversations are starting. We don't have any concrete plans in place, but, you know, I think it's important that um, as primary care navigates in that direction that, you know, we're able to move alongside with the team also. And to Julie's point um, that so much of our work gets to happen virtually. And so um, we don't need to uh, miss a beat in still providing care. It's just virtual um, might end up being extended a little bit longer than um, being um, going back to that in-person care. Yeah. Um, and, and this is Sharon. I'll just tag on that um, at Kaiser, there's a pretty strong um, labor management partnership as well. And that as we kind of roll out and have these discussions about how this is going to happen, um, labor is also going to be at the table um, with management and discussing what that's going to look like. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things that I'll comment on here and then get back to you guys as panelists is that um, I just read an article actually today by uh, Don Berwick, and I'll, I'll post a link here. And it's a lot about what I've been thinking lately around this uh, circumstance, is that uh, really what we're facing here um, are a lot of choices. Um, it feels as if we're waiting for conditions to change and waiting for things external to us to happen. But in the end, especially with regard to this particular question, it really comes down to our choices the conditions are actually not going to change very much in the near future. It's really about how we are going to make choices about risk in particular. And so I think that's what a lot of our clinics are doing right now is just assessing risk. And I just wanna remind folks that that risk is not just about uh, real actual risk or risk that can be measured. It's actually perceived risk as well. So I wanna encourage folks to be talking with their staff, uh, talking with their patients about how they feel about coming back to in-person visits. And that has to be factored in just as much because uh, you can't operate in an environment where fear uh, uh, persists, especially a healthcare environment. So these are really hard questions, hard choices. Different people are gonna find different variations of answers. Um, and Nepali, can I, can I comment on that uh, yeah. as well? Um, you know, and I'm really glad that you said that. And it's something that, 
you know, Bridget and I, uh, I don't know if it's for good or bad, uh, we get to spend almost every waking moment with each other. So we've literally like kind of lived through this um, as for we, the good. for the good, I, I would definitely say for the good. But the one you thing should, I, You should provide context that you guys are married. <laughs> yes, we are married, to yes. Other people. <laughs> <laughs> to each other. So um, the, the one thing that we have talked with our leadership team, we've done kind of uh, organization-wide huddles, um, is this is important uh, of like being kind to yourself uh, throughout this because as you said, uh, Natali, there's so much fear um, and uncertainty that everybody is feeling. And you know, I know our response has been, hey, we're primary care. Like we need to do what primary care does. We need to be here. Um, and I think a lot of times that it came off almost like a driving force that some people didn't feel at that time. Uh, there was a lot of concern. There's a lot of risk. And uh, I know there had been a number, this was actually why I love having trainees uh, in our program is because through a conversation with one of our interns, it's like, hey, not everybody might be feeling that right now. And how do we have that grace for each other? How do we have that kindness for each other uh, to be able to really work through some of these things? And as people have put it on the chat box, and I think as everybody's already said as a panelist, we literally took things that would take months to do, years, years even to do them right, in a matter of days, and the amount of stress that that put on the system, on providers, on everybody. Um, so I think what my mind is just trying to say is I really try to um, reiterate this idea, be kind to yourself and be gracious to everybody that is working. Everybody's doing the best they can. Um, and it is a tough situation to feel like, I don't know if I do agree with this. I don't know if I don't agree with this workflow. I wanna be there, I don't wanna be there. Be kind. That's right, yeah. We need a lot of grace for each other these days. Um, it is Natalie, a if I could jump in real quick, uh, just want to, for those that have to drop off now, we will be sending uh, a, an uh, evaluation out via email today and a follow-up email later. We're going to keep this Q&A going, uh, but wanted to make that note to people that have to jump off. We will be sending an evaluation out today to you. Uh, and Julie, I'll pass to you for a, a final message before we get back to the Q&A. Yeah, if you have to have to leave, um, just want to say what a fantastic time. Um, and wow, uh, lots of work happening, really meaningful uh, work that's happening that is so important. And um, just want to share, you know, uh, let's just go forth and uh, share some of that BHC light out there that is happening right now. And it is really, really important and it's really needed um, what we do in primary care and for our community health. So thank you to all of you out there who are doing this work um, at this time. Great, so uh, a lot of you have asked about recordings. Yes, this will be sent out. The link to the recording will be sent out, including this expanded Q&A if you need to miss this uh, Q&A. And it is really so nice to see all the folks uh, greeting panelists and saying hi to each other out there, including folks from around the world. I think we've had folks from New Zealand and Peru uh, log on today at least. So uh, we're really pleased to have brought together this community. So let's keep going with the Q&A here real quick. And Mexico, thank you, Angel. Um, Viva Mexico. Uh, so, uh, a couple of, of questions here that were really uh, interesting. Are any of your clinics billing for collaborative care management codes? And while we're talking about billing, are any of your clinics, um, have, have any of your clinics successfully collected any uh, billing data on, on your telehealth stuff? And, and can you speak to some of that, right? Um, just by context, I'll say uh, this, of course, billing varies state to state. Telehealth billing varies even more widely uh, payer to payer. So we can't solve everybody's situation today, but just note that this is really payer to payer specific unless you're talking about Medicare as a singular entity. So um, uh, let's see. Let's start with uh, actually Laura and Sharon. You guys collected any information on billing, telehealth billing, and do you guys do uh, any collaborative care management billing? Okay, I can um, start to answer that. Um, we actually um, do not, um, as of now, just kind of how we're set up in the system with Kaiser um, being an HMO. Um, and so, and then um, uh, not with actually collaborative care either. So um, I apologize that you started with us as I am unable to, to speak to either one of those. Um, That's what I get for not knowing uh, your payer provider setup. <laughs> David and Bridget. Now we know. 
Yeah, you know, so uh, I will say um, we're in a good state of Washington, uh, particularly our Medicaid uh, program that provides a lot of different uh, coverage and really values um, uh, not only healthcare, but I think really values the mental health and behavioral health mm-hmm. aspects. So, as far as reimbursement goes for um, our Medicaid, which being a federally qualified health center, I think we're about 60 to 70 mm-hmm. percent about of our population is Medicaid. It's been great. Now, the, the one, and when I say great, I can't give a specific uh, estimate about what that is, but the uh, phone visits have been counted as our F2HC encounter rate, which is the same for any billable provider within the state. So that's fantastic. Um, the one thing that I would say, though, this is why, as Bridget was saying at the beginning, why it's such an important thing that we have a team of billers, of IT, of all, of, you know, we have a specific EHR, all scripts. If this was just up to us to be like, oh, we would never get paid at all, right? So Bridget was very intentional at the beginning, working with our IT department, coming up with macros, coming up with templates to make sure it's an easy process to include everything that we need to include. And I think it's important for folks out there, if you are getting integrated into a system, that you don't take on everything and say, oh, well, I'm a behavioral health department, so therefore I need to have my own billers, my own coders, my own. Use what, you know, if it really is truly integrated, behind the scenes it should be integrated as well. So we were not trying to reinvent the wheel. We got with the uh, billers and coders for both behavioral health and medical. And that that whole process uh, was 100% uh, together. And our our billers and coders also said that, that we are getting really good reimbursement. They didn't, like I said, use specific numbers. Um, but they were getting really good uh, reimbursement and better than they thought for private insurance, which I thought was interesting. And then I looked at our budget for last month and it was very, it was doing, we were doing very well. And then we got that news, as most of you know, about the t- uh, Medicare. There were so many folks that did not have video, audio uh, options, but they were willing to do phone. And so what, what we actually told, uh, what I told my team was, do the right thing clinically and don't worry about it. I know that we don't always want to do that, but in that case, if a person is unable to get access or they're going to decline a visit, so it's between a phone or nothing, I was like, do the right thing clinically. We did, and then it came through that for Medicare, they're going to count the phone visits. So that was uh, really important. And we don't do any um, collaborative care. Sorry about that. Sorry. Do the right thing always is always a good policy. I love that. Uh, Kristen, uh, any report from you, assuming you're not an HMO? I'm not an HMO. Uh, Operating as an FQ, I mirror almost exactly what uh, Bridget and David's uh, experience has been. Oregon was a little later to the game and just kind of getting up with uh, reimbursement for telephone encounters and telehealth in general in primary care uh, for our team. But we are on board. It's looking good. We're having success. Um, And we too took the same approach around our Medicare and we were thrilled to see it come through but we were making clinical decision-making around access and ensuring they were connected to somebody either way. And a uh, report from Wisconsin and Beth. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear my FQHC friends in the house. Um, I think it, it's, very, it's very similar. Um, I will say one of the things um, that we had to do was a little more advocacy um, related to the parity piece. So telehealth um, changes here happen to include actually telephonic only for evaluation and management codes. Um, for the behavioral health um, telephonic codes for us to be able to use were actually set to expire when the initial emergency declaration ended in our state, which was May 12th. Um, And so we had this very tight timeline um, to try to roll out some video and try to figure out what to do. Um, Luckily, the Friday before, um, that Monday, we got um, information that 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 was going to change, right? That that allowed um, this to to continue for reimbursement for telephonic only um, indefinitely in the context of the pandemic. So not necessarily permanent change, but at least in the, uh, the immediate response to everything that's happening. The reason I highlight that is I think advocacy and voicing the importance around parity and talking about the importance of behavioral health is really important. And we have a lot of great support around that. I think sometimes it's just can be, oh, we didn't think about that or, hey, we need to address that um, in a more intentional way. Um, And so we were able to really collaborate. And I think that that's a win um, for all of us in the state um, and especially those that are underserved and have, um, have needs that they have choice, right? It's telephonic, video, 
what can you do and what do you have access to and the lack of access to video doesn't mean you don't get care um i said the same thing of like well, we're still going to call because if people need a phone visit they're going to have a phone visit and we're going to provide the care um so to be able to continue to be reimbursed for the care and the provision of service we're providing um is a win for the organization related to sustainability but at the end of the day it's, it's a win for our patients um to make sure that they continue to get the care that they need absolutely and in fact uh uh, that, I'm going to highlight a couple of the points you made there, uh, Beth, that I think one of the things that this pandemic has highlighted for us is that a lot of the things that we thought were too hard to do before were a matter of choices that we were making. So the, the speed with which we brought up telehealth says it wasn't that hard. We just needed to make a choice to make it happen, right? And same thing with any of these advocacy pieces. Um, these are choices that uh, systems are making to keep the status quo. This has allowed us to shift the balance of those choices. So yes, advocacy in this, in this piece is really, really, really important. Now, the other thing I wanna highlight is this whole idea of phone-based consults. Um, I've actually, this has been something I've fought for years with, often with trainees, uh, sometimes with staff who don't like calling patients and don't feel like it's effective. Uh, but for years I've been saying, look, calling someone on the phone is just as effective as sitting in front of them. It may feel different to you because you're not used to the nonverbals. But for the patient on the patient end, a lot of times they prefer it. And that's one of the things I've heard time and time again talking to folks across the country. So I'd like you guys to, to highlight just by asking you um, what percentage of your work is right now over the phone versus uh, even more complicated video telehealth. And I'll start with myself and I'll tell you that 99% of the work that I do clinically is over the phone. Uh, so Beth, what's at Access? Are you guys still 100% phone-based? Um, so this week on Thursday is our first um, video visit. Um, and we're doing like five this week um, to start to pilot. Um, but the rest of it is all telephonic. And one of the things I wanted to point out around that is we've had several of our patients that maybe were two bus rides and an afternoon off of work um, that they couldn't do to make it into the clinic. So to be able to do it over the phone um, and be flexible with the time, um, seeing increased engagement, right? Because we're meeting people where they are in a modality they find easy to access um, and an equivalent, right, to a face-to-face -face visit. And that to me has been really encouraging. And if nothing else, I think it's shined a light on that around the flexibility in the way we would provide a provision of care um, and how patients really want and need that service. So is that opinion shared by the rest of you? Have you guys found the phone to be as effective or are your staff feeding back different information to you? We love phone visits. Um, we, most of them are. Uh, we give patient preference just because our workflow with the whole medical system was able to get Zoom up so quickly. So um, I leave it 100% of the patient preference, whether or not they want. I normally lead with a phone and, and then offer if they would like the Zoom as well. And if they want Zoom, we'll make it happen. Uh, but we did find that uh, some of our clinics was, they really, really wanted to do, and, and a lot of it was the medical side, but they really wanted to do audio and visual. And I actually think that it led to them being a little bit behind with regards to whereas like, you know, being able to make those calls and checking in with everybody was such an easier process than trying to get the video set up. And so they lagged behind a little bit. I think that that, that can hurt patient care. So uh, long story short, we have it up and running. And if somebody requests it, we'll do it. But for me as a clinician, I prefer phone. It seems easier and I feel like I'm more accessible to the whole team. And if I could add two quick things um, uh, to that as well, the one thing, and I'm, I'm gonna give credit to this, uh, to Bridget to this, because Natalia, you said about how you've advocated for this. I've always been very adverse to the phone. I've always been like, ah, I don't wanna do phone. Like I'll see people in uh, person. And during this first week of everything, before we knew that uh, we were gonna get reimbursed through Medicaid for phone and stuff, Bridget was like, hey, I don't care. Like we just need to reach our community. We need to reach our patients. And I was like, ah, I don't know, Bridget. Like, I don't know if people are going to like that. I have been. I was like, call everybody. And now. <laughs> it, it's been an amazing and process uh, to hear what patients, like literally every single week, patients are saying, you have been my lifeline through this entire process. And the other thing that I would say, I think very subtly what this has done, and I think BHCs can lead this, 
is it improves medical providers comfort competence and confidence in doing phone visits because we think this is a different world for us for me our medical providers this is a different universe for and, them. and it took a lot we started sending a lot of reverse warm handoffs because they weren't really being a, i mean it was just scary for the medical providers and it is amazing to see how much medical visits they can actually get done on the phone and zoom so we've got a lot of people their medical care just by checking in doing the behavioral health stuff and then reconnecting them back to their team. And almost on a daily basis, we were sending out success stories to the entire organization about phone visits with that hope that it would ripple out, that people would be like, this is a meaningful way to connect with patients. Well, I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, anybody uh, have a last word that is burning within? Patty, you can have it. You may want to unmute yourself though, Patty, because it's hard to have the last word when no one can hear you. <laughs> but you can see I was drawing my hands around, so you know I was there. No, I just wanted to say, you know, this is a great time for innovating and experimenting. And um, I, one of the most um, uh, rewarding kinds of things I've been challenged to do is to start to develop training curriculums for virtual training of behavioral health consultants and I, it's just really forced me to think through some of the procedures I've typically used for the live trainings and uh, see a lot of benefits for training virtually and um, I, anticipating that it would be very hard and there would be a lot of challenges it it has not been that hard and i feel very connected to the people i train and we actually in trying to get the training done are doing things clinically that are different and that are probably uniquely helpful in terms of serving underserved uh, so that's just a wonderful thing and reaching people like and rural areas and people most at risk, um, always, but particularly so uh, during the pandemic. So I, in that way, I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm certainly thankful for everybody's time and effort. Co-Imagine has done a great job. Uh, Julie has really organized us and brought on just great people. And Naftali, I don't know how you do all of that answering in the chat at the same time, staying so Amazing. <laughs> It's a Zoom world, Patty. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom world. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, remember, we'll continue some of this into uh, the blog that we'll put on integratedcarenews.com. We'll put the chat there as well for folks who can read that. Um, and just a reminder, I, I think, Patty, great point. Uh, this really, I think, is actually, uh, ironically enough, a golden age for behavioral health. Um, what we need to do is turn it into a golden age for primary care. Uh, that's our next phase. So let's go out, let's get it done. Um, thank you to all our attendees. We'll see you soon. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Bye.